Father, we thank you for our gathering together. Thank you for the love you have given us for yourself and for the gospel and for the souls of the people all around. Thank you, Lord, for the commitment and consecration your people have for your work. And I pray, Lord, you'll bless our ministries and bless the work of our hands and bless our families. Bless everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you open our eyes of understanding that we'll behold wondrous things out of your word tonight in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Tonight, we're looking at Philippians chapter 2. And we're looking at verses 3, 4, and 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or being glory, but in lowliness of mind, underline the word mind, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Then in verse 4, in verse 4 it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others now verse 5 let this mind underline the word mind let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus the mind of christ a christ-like mind and then it says in verse 8 in verse 8 it says i'm being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. You understand the mind of Christ? And then obedience to God, obedience to the Heavenly Father, even to the point of sacrificial death. As we bring those two words together, Number one is the obedience of Christ, acceptable obedience unto God. Number two is the mind, the mind of Christ. Tonight, the topic is acceptable obedience from a Christ-like mind. Acceptable obedience from a Christ-like mind. You see, obedience has various levels. There are people that have superficial obedience. It doesn't come to the heart. It doesn't get to the mind. It just on the surface. You want me to do that? Yes, I will. Inside my heart, I don't agree. Inside my heart, I don't understand. I don't know why you should tell me to do this. And in my mind, in my heart, it's not my will to do it. But to avoid rebuke and to avoid punishment and to be in your good book, I will and then I obey. It's the obedience of the letter. It doesn't get to the spirit. It's superficial and it is not acceptable to the Lord. But then there is sincere obedience. It's coming from the heart. I respect the Lord. I love the Lord. I honor the Lord. I appreciate the Lord. I'm so grateful He saved me. And because of who He is, and because of where I place Him above myself, beyond myself, and He has saved me. I'm so grateful to Him because of that. Sincerely, my spirit from my heart from my mind from my soul from everything within me and with all the skill i have i want to obey the lord that is sincere obedience and it's a wide gap almost a gap of eternity between that superficial obedience and then the sincere scriptural sanctified sanctifying obedience and the one that is acceptable to the lord is the one from the heart is the one from a christ-like mind that's why the topic is acceptable obedience from a christ-like mind we're dividing the message to three parts number one 
the pleasing, submissive obedience from the Christ-like mind. Obedience, which is submissive to the Lord and submissive to the law of God and submissive to everything the Lord wants without taking away and without adding and we do it in love and we do it from the heart submissive and it is it pleases the lord because it is coming from a christ-like mind number two the perilous chief neck disobedience of the carnal mind the word of god says sinners are carnal in their mind and apostates are carnal in their mind. The people who are in disagreement with God who say, well, I know what God says, but this is what I want to do. They are stiff-necked, they are stubborn, and they are rebellious, and it is the kind of life that lives in disobedience. It knows this is the way, stand in the way, and seek for the old path, and walk ye in it, and then the mind says, I will not walk in it. I will go my own way. And God says, I've stretched out my hand unto a rebellious nation, all the time but still they have refused and it is perilous it will make people to perish the perilous sip next disobedience of the carnal mind number three now is the priestly steadfast obedience through the crucified mind i am crucified with christ that is the old nature is crucified the carnal mind is crucified and the selfish self-centered nature is crucified with christ nevertheless i live but not i it is christ who lives in me he lives big in me he lives totally in me and then every action and everything i do is being motivated and generated by the christ who lives in me and because of that i'm like a priest unto the lord and because i'm like a priest unto the lord i'm totally devoted to the lord and i'm steadfast about it and i'm obedient to him because the mind has been crucified and is totally submissive unto the lord let's look at point number one is the pleasing submissive obedience from the christ-like mind philippians chapter 2 again let us look at verse 3 it says let nothing be done through strife of inglory but in lowliness of mind in lowliness of mind you see pride will make us to go against almost everybody we're like an island in the midst of the people of god we're proud we have ego and because of the pride we look down on everybody else and we have the lone rangers who can do everything that's what they think by themselves and therefore there is strife if anybody wants to get near and say can we what, what do you mean we i can do it all alone by myself and then there's vain glory and they begin to say i did this i did this and everything is surprised and the lord is saying are we born again are we children of god are we in the family of god well let us then not do anything through strife of vain glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves let everyone say number one without the grace of god he will be better than i without the grace of god she will be better than i even with the grace of god there are areas i believe my brother is better than i am and my sister is better than i am there are things he knows there are things she can do that i cannot do and so we can complement each other because we have the mind of christ and we're lowly and we can esteem the other better than ourselves it tells us when that happens in verse 4 it says look not every man on his own things that's what the people of the world that's what they do they look at 
their own things. My own shall be well brought up and well organized. Even if the other man has his life scattered, his family scattered, his mind, his heart scattered, and even if uh, what I'm doing destroys the other man's uh, personality and project and whatever, once my own is all right, for them that's all right. That's not the mind of Christ. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, the advantage of others, the progress of others, the happiness of others, the joy of others. And it says that is only possible when uh, verse 5 is in place. It says in verse 5, let this man mind there is that mind that mind of lucifer i will exalt my throne above the throne of god there is that other mind the mind of those demons and those spirits and they want to scatter the work of god there is a mind of self like saul and we want to do this and bring this to sacrifice to your god even though the lord has said we should destroy everything there is the mind of absalom why should david sit down there and say he is king i will be the next king and it's too late he said he's not leaving the place he's not quitting i'll drive him out and get there he says but that mind is the mind of the canal is the mind of satan is the mind of evil spirit is the mind of people who do not have real genuine experience of the lord but let this mind the mind of christ and the mind of the convert and the mind of a real child of God be in you which was also in Christ Jesus what kind of mind was in the Lord Jesus Christ and what was the evidence of that kind of mind in the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 8 reading from verse 28 John chapter 8 we're reading from verse 28 then said Jesus unto them when ye have lifted up the son of man can you think about what jesus said he was actually talking about his death and he talked about his death as being lifted up lifting up the son of man he was thinking about his crucifixion and he said when you have lifted up the son of man why because that death will bring salvation to other people that that death will bring righteousness to other people and it will link them with god and get them to heaven and therefore he says suffering he doesn't look at it as suffering that's the mind of christ crucifixion sacrifice he wasn't looking at that as anything painful because it's going to bring salvation to multitudes of people and therefore in his mind he talks about that suffering has been lifted up you see when you have the mind of christ you look at everything from christ's perspective are you suffering you have to label are you sweating are you doing something and it appears ordinarily normally painful but it's going to bring salvation to others it's going to bring uplifting to others you look at it from christ's perspective because you are thinking with the mind of christ when ye have lifted up the son of man then shall ye know that i am him and that i do nothing of myself that's the son of god that's a savior that's a redeemer he says my might is i do nothing of myself but as my father has taught me i speak these things that's the might of christ the one that doesn't say i have graduated i know it all i have common sense i have sanctified sense I have experience, I have this, I have that. I don't need interaction with a senior person. I don't need interaction with a leader or anybody above me. I can do it all by myself. No, Christ's mind, Christ-like mind is the one that says, I do nothing of myself. You know, do I still have to ask permission? What do I do? How do I do this? How do I get that way? All these many years, I know what to do. 
all these many years i don't need anybody watching over my shoulder i can get this done christ says but i don't do that the might of christ is the one that will look at the will of the father that is passing on to us from leadership and then will say i do nothing of myself we're looking at romans chapter 15. in romans chapter 15 we're reading from verse 3. romans chapter 15 reading from verse 3 it says for even christ please not himself that's the mind of christ uh, the mind of christ is not the mind that is going on that doesn't please me i won't do it be a house fellowship leader that one does not please me that's not what i want i will not do that i'll be a uh, this or be that no i cannot do that uh, you want me to work and you want me to serve i'll tell you what pleases me i'll tell you what i really enjoy if you can give me what i really enjoy you'll be surprised how I will do it if everybody said that there may be areas of the work that nobody will choose because that one does not please me when we have the mind of Christ look at what it says for even Christ please not himself but as it is written the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me you know the mind of Christ, all the reproach that he suffered. And you know, he was sinless. He was perfect. He was spotless. No fault. He was faultless. There was no error. And yet such a perfect person. Perfect because he's God. Perfect because he's man. Perfect because he's the very express image of the Father. Yet reproaches came on him because of the people that didn't understand. And he said he makes himself the Son of God. And because of that, they reproached him. Uh huh. You've been here and said, Before Abraham was, I am. You're not even 50 years old yet. And have you seen Abraham? they didn't understand but he bore all the reproaches and the mind of christ is the one that will bear whatever reproach they can call us by any name he is a pastor whatever he is a deeper he is higher he is a, the greater one he is the perfect one he is the holy holy uh, deeper life remember whatever reproach it says if we have the mind of christ we actually rejoice look at verse 4 in verse 4 it tells us for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning we should learn from every everything we have learned we have seen other characters and other people that followed after christ and we have seen the perfect example of christ and the mind of christ and whatsoever things were reaching a full time that we have read they were reaching for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope look at um, hebrews chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 8 hebrews chapter 5 we're reading from verse 8 it says though he were a son capital s the very son of god look at this yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered yet learnt he obedience by the things which he suffered you see the lord jesus christ as he was as he was in this world as god and yet he made himself of no reputation and he pushed aside he emptied himself of his divinity and now he lived as a man temptation came he overcame and hunger and thirst and all that came he still kept in the will in the word of god and as a man there were things he went through and it says he learned obedience by the things which he suffered and is our example we have the might of christ when anything comes to my life if i'm going to demonstrate the mind of christ i'll be asking 
what is this suffering permitted to do in my life so I can learn something? If I have the mind of Christ and I am following after Christ and now there is suffering, there's reproach, there's persecution, what am I to learn from the things that I suffer? Am I learning obedience by the things which I suffered? The suffering, does it remind me I have, I'm slowing down or I'm walking too fast? The suffering, does it remind me I'm debating a little and the Lord permits that suffering so I can learn obedience? The suffering that comes is it because I need to learn meekness. I need to learn humility. I need to learn submission. Is that why that suffering is coming? The pressure that is coming. Is that because God wants me to learn perseverance and he wants me to learn steadfastness? There must be something God wants me to learn. God wants you to learn. When he permits anything that causes pain, that causes displeasure, that causes discomfort, that you say, why is this happening? The sin is not comfortable for my flesh and this sin is not pleasant to my personality don't uh, shake it off and don't strive and don't have vain glory ask yourself i have the mind of christ i'm born again i'm converted i'm a child of god and if this suffering has come and if this pain has come what does he want me to learn he learned obedience i learn obedience I learned meekness, I learned gentleness, I learned submission, I learned perseverance by the things that I suffer. If I allow the mind of Christ to be registered in me and to abide in me. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading from verse 16. Hebrews chapter 10. We're reading from verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. We'll be saved. Our sins have been forgiven. And now there is another work of grace. And it is called circumcision of heart. It is called sanctification of the heart. It is called the purging and the purifying of the heart. It is referred to as the uprooting of the Adamic nature. It is the death of the old man. And when that sanctification takes place, here is what God does. He says, I put my laws into their heart and I write the laws in their mind. That means then the law of God will not be far away from us. You see, when we are saved, our sins are forgiven and the desire to be obedient to God is there in our heart. But the law of God is outside. We're looking at it, we're reading it, and we're making our lives by His grace, by prayer, by faith. We're making our lives to conform to that word we're reading outside us. But now we come back to God. And instead of the law of God, the word of God, the precepts of God, the promise of God being outside, it is now on the inside. And the Lord writes his own laws in our heart and in our mind. And because it is so much inside us, it becomes easier now and becomes uh, more prevalent because it controls our will. It controls our mind. It controls our life from within. 
and now that sanctification experience makes it much easier to now obey the word of god look at verse 19 it says in verse 19 having therefore brethren born again children of god members of the family of god having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus when you are born again you're made righteous and holy but then there's still a holier level and then there's even the holiest it says now we have the boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus in verse 20 it says by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us by a new and living way it's not like the old way of the old covenant old testament bring a ram bring an animal and get to the priest and then they slaughter it and then they apply the blood and you have if the priest is not available you cannot make the sacrifice a new one living way the priest is now out of the way and you have the direct connection with the lord and you can pray and you can present yourself before the lord now by a new one living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh look at verse 21 in verse 21 and having an high priest over the house of God verse 22 it says let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water in verse 23 then it says let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised he promised us salvation we came he saved us he has promised us sanctification we come and he sanctifies us he has promised that he's going to write his word and write his law in our heart and as we come we believe that and we hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering knowing he is faithful who has promised and when the lord has done that he tells us in second timothy chapter one reading from verse six second timothy chapter one reading from verse six wherefore i put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of god which is in thee which is in thee we have enough grace in our hearts now enough gift in our hearts now and enough power in our hearts now and enough knowledge revelation in our hearts now and we can do the will of god we can obey the lord we have the very mind of christ in us now and we can obey the lord and it says in verse 7 in verse 7 for god has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind that's the mind again the mind of christ we can have that mind and i pray that every one of us without exception will have the mind of christ in jesus name first corinthians chapter 2 verse 16 first corinthians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 16 for who has known the mind of the lord that he may instruct him look at this but we have the mind of christ we have the mind of christ if we have gone to the lord and the lord has made the great exchange and he has taken our sin and he has given us his righteousness he has taken our own mind away he has given us his own mind he has taken away the impurity the adamic impurity away from us he has given us his own purity he has taken away our carnal heart and he has given us the christ-like heart he says now we have the mind of christ and because we have the mind of christ we can be obedient unto the heavenly father 
as Christ was obedient to the Heavenly Father. I pray that this great work will be visible in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. In your life and my life in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two now. Number two is the perilous, stiff neck disobedience of the carnal mind. You see, there are different kinds of mind. Otherwise, the apostle would not have said, by inspiration, let this mind be in you. Because there is another kind of mind. Uh, let's look at, um, we're looking at Romans chapter 8 and reading from verse 5. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Those who have not come to know the Lord as their personal Savior, and those who are still in their natural self, in their original self, in their sinful self, it says they mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, in verse 6 it says, For to be carnally minded is death. To be carnally minded is death. For, uh, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7, verse 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Basically, the carnal mind does not want any outside control. Control from heaven, control from the scriptures, control from Christ, control from the law of God, control from the Bible, control from uh, another person that has a new nature, does not want control or correction or counsel or any directive that is not of his own mind because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be because of that carnal nature and carnal mind even if you wanted to the ability is not there even if you wanted to he has a propensity towards evil and he cannot be subject to the law of god neither indeed can be it tells us in verse 8 in verse 8 it says so then they that are in the flesh carnal cannot please god if somebody is not born again, he might be highly educated, he might be so-called civilized, he might have whatever, might have wealth or riches and anything in this world, might have any position, might even have religion, but religion cannot make him obedient to the Lord if the might of Christ is not there. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That, that was the problem of people in the old covenant. And it's the problem of people in many religious circles today that because the carnal mind and the fleshly mind and the defiled mind has not been taken away, they cannot fulfill the will of God. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we're reading from verse 19. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we're reading from verse 19, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. Here was Samuel asking Saul, you know better, you are a king, the first king in Israel, and the first kings, the kings of Israel were supposed to take all the writings of Moses, Genesis to Deuteronomy, copy out for themselves and read very often. And when they read, they ought to also obey that word. How is it you've done this? And the Lord had given you commandment and you have gone the other way. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it says, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, 
I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. You know, carnal minds are not readily going to accept. They have not done the right thing. They will always have an excuse. Carnal mind will always have a reason why they have gone their own way, a reason why they have not obeyed the Lord fully. They are intelligent enough to disobey, but they are not submissive enough to obey the Lord. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I've gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I've brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. In verse 21, it says, But the people, you see, the carnal mind is very quick in shifting blame. They are responsible for their disobedience, but they will shift blame. I have done this, I have done this. They will contradict themselves. I brought back Agag, the kings of the, the king of the people whom I should have destroyed. That's contradicting yourself, Saul. But now they are going to shift blame. Uh, do you ever feel like that? That you've done something that shouldn't have been done. And then you are challenged. First of all, you didn't think anybody will have the uh, courage of mind and the presence of mind to even challenge you. But somebody had the presence of mind and courage of mind to say, this is not right. There is still a Samuel in the house. There is still a Samuel that will not be timid because he had the spirit of a sound mind. And there was no fear in him. And then the very first thing a carnal mind will do is to shift the blame. But the people took up the spoil. And the sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. I know that. Should have been utterly destroyed. But then we have a reason for that. They are always uh, painting black, white. And they are always given a good receipt for a bad action. That's the carnal mind. The carnal mind will always want to say, yes, I understand. I understand that that is not proper. But you know what? I want you to help me look at the other side of the situation. It is to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. That's the carnal mind. And anytime you find yourself defending what is uh, not defendable and trying to excuse what is inexcusable and trying to paint a better a good picture when actually it's a bad picture that's the operation of a carnal mind and we need to get out of that we need to get back to calvary and let christ by his grace take away that carnality of mind and stop giving excuses and then wrapping something that is evil with a good uh, presentable wrapper. Now when it says is to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. I'll come back to that but look at verse 22. In verse 22 it tells us and Samuel said as God as great delight in bond offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hacking than the fat of rams. I said I was going to come back to that sacrifice, that kind of sacrifice. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 27. Proverbs chapter 21, reading from verse 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind. The sacrifice of the wicked, the sacrifice of the sinner is abomination. Normally, 
the Lord does not expect that. He says, so has called you to appear in my court, in my presence. When you have not given your heart unto the Lord, the sacrifice, whatever it is, is abomination. How much more now? When he bringeth it with a wicked mind. Now we're coming to Titus chapter 1. We're reading from verse 16. Uh, Titus chapter 1, reading from verse 16. It says, they profess that they know God. Did you hear what Saul said? I went to the place where the Lord sent me. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. They profess that they know God. They're religious, but in works, they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient and to every good work, reprobate. To every good work, they are abominable. They are rejected by the Lord. They are reprobates. Why? Romans chapter 1, verse 28. In Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, those who have carnal minds and those who have unregenerated minds, they're not born again. If they were born again before, all that remains now is the shell and the shallowness of a lost experience. And now they want blessings from God, healing from God, promotion from God, success from God, but not the law of God, not the precepts of God. They don't want anything to obey. They only want whatever they will enjoy. I'll enjoy blessing. I'll enjoy promotion. I'll enjoy prosperity. I'll enjoy this and that. But if it is to obey, uh -uh, they don't want that. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Reprobate mind, carnal mind, the same thing. Unconverted mind or regenerate mind, the same thing. Carnal mind and defiled mind, the same thing. God gave them over. God is not going to force himself upon the sinner. The sinner has to come. He has to repent. He has to believe on the Lord. And then there will be conversion. But because they didn't want that. And they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. He gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. To do those things which are not convenient. When it says those things which are not convenient, those things are convenient for him because he loves them he loves the flesh he loves sin he loves evil he loves stolen water that is sweet in his mouth he loves stolen prosperity that is good to him it is convenient for him but what the husband is doing which is evil with a carnal mind, convenient for him, is not convenient for the wife. What the wife is doing in a backsliding stage, in a sinful state, which she loves and is convenient for her, is not convenient for the husband. What the children are doing, and they're sowing their wild oats, and they love it, they enjoy it. It's convenient for them, but it's not convenient for their parents. What those people who are violent and they run here and there and destroy that and destroy that, they feel happy. They feel they're expressing 
matter their nature to the community it's convenient for them and they're shouting the praise of those who are doing it with them and they say do it again do it again burn it down it's convenient for them it's not convenient for the country or for the community because you see that's the action of a reprobate mind anytime you're doing anything ask yourself I enjoy this, I appreciate this, this one is convenient for me. Is it convenient? Is it enjoyed? Is it appreciated by all people around me? Anytime your liberty conflicts with the liberty of other people, anytime your happiness conflicts with the happiness of other people, anytime your desires conflict with the desires of other people, and you say, I enjoy it, I don't know whether other people enjoy it or not, but I like what I do, think about how other people are being destroyed by what you say your delight in. Look at verse 29. In verse 29, it tells us being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. Then in verse 30, in verse 30, it says, but biters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Disobedience is linked with a mind that rejects God. I pray our mind will not be like that in Jesus' name. Amen. Good amen from the church. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17, look at this. It says, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that he henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. You see, the mind is the mind. What, whatever we do is the mind. Well, I need to explain to you. Uh, the mind and the heart are sometimes used interchangeably. I want you to look at two references and compare them. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 31. In Jeremiah chapter 7, Reading from verse 31, there's something I need to point out here. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31. It says, They have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. This is what I want you to look at on the line, which I commanded them not neither came each into my heart it says what these people are doing never came to my heart i never thought anyone in his right senses will do that it never came into my heart my heart my heart look at jeremiah chapter 19 we're reading from verse 5 in Jeremiah chapter 19, reading from verse 5, they have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal. Look at this, which I commanded not, nor speak it, neither came into my mind. This verse is like the other verse we read in chapter 7, verse 31. That one says, never came to my heart. This one says, never came to my mind. They used interchangeably your heart, your mind. 
when your heart is transformed your mind is transformed that's why when you are born again and the lord transforms your heart you say somebody says let's go and do this which we used to enjoy you say my mind is not there anymore your heart has been transformed and somebody is doing something and is enjoying it but you know it's destroying other people it's defiling other people and is smiling and doing it and you are quiet you are silently sorrowful how could this person be doing this this is convenient for him that's convenient for her but it's not convenient for me why your heart has been transformed and then he approaches you and he says uh -uh, what's happening to you are you not happy with what is going on and with what you are doing we're enjoying it are you not enjoying it and then you say my mind is not like that anymore it's your heart as well as your mind when the heart has been converted then the mind is also turned around and is changed and the things i used to do i do them no more and the places i used to go i go there no more and the things i used to uh, stuff in my mind and uh, put in my mind i don't have them in my mind anymore because things are different now and i pray in our lives things will be totally different we'll have the mind of christ and the heart of christ in jesus name Hebrews reading from chapter 2 Hebrews chapter 2 we're reading from verse 1 Hebrews chapter 2 we're reading from verse 1 therefore we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let it sleep that is the things which we have heard to have the might of Christ and to have this Christ like mind and for that mind to be expressing only the will of God let us all the time give heed and be obedient to what we have heard lest at any time it should slip away from us in verse 2 it says for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward it says in verse 3 how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us that heard him now Christ has died for us look at verse 9 in verse 9 but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man thank God for the grace of God thank God for the love of God and for the love he has towards you and for the love he has towards everyone that he has tasted death for every man look at verse 10 in verse 10 for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory bringing us out of shame bringing us out of sin bringing us out of the carnality of the mind and bringing us from all defilement and bringing us from guilt and bringing us from the captivity to the fleshly as he has now brought us unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering and then in verse 11 we have been saved now there's sanctification for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren and i pray that this great work second work of grace sanctification that purifies the heart that sanctifies the heart that makes the heart holy and that takes away all that carnality of heart that God has done will be permanent in every one of us in Jesus' name. Did I hear a good amen? amen? Point number three now. In point number three is the priestly steadfast obedience through the crucified mind. 
the crucified mind who have come to Christ and any sin rejecting the law of God any sin despising the law of God any sin uh, trying to shirk uh, the law of God we have now been free from that and he has set us free and look at what he has done in first Peter chapter 2 reading from verse 5 first Peter chapter 2 verse 5 ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God what we offer acceptable to God through by Jesus Christ and then in verse 9 in verse 9 but she are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation there's no carnality here now there's no fleshly action or act here now. There's no depravity here now. There's no old man here now. Because now his hand and his grace and his favor and the oppression of his power has come in again. And he has done this second work of grace, sanctified. Now we're chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye he should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Canality will deem that marvelous light. Canality will put off that marvelous light. Canality will distort that experience that we profess to have. But now, as he makes us peculiar people, and it takes away the carnality out of our nature. We're now showing forth and we're now shining forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that happened as we had faith in him. Faith that with God all things are possible. That he created us originally. He created Adam and Eve. And he looked at everything he created. And he says it was very good. And the same thing as he comes to recreate us. And then he has done another work again. And he has written his law in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit, on our inner man. What he has done is good and it makes us now peculiar and we're different from the people of the world. It tells us in Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20, Galatians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. It says, I've got it. But Christ provided it for every man. If I have got it, you can go to that same source and go to Calvary. It will be yours. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But it's a different kind of life now. I live as in the presence of God. I live to the joy of the Lord. I live pleasing the Lord all the time. And I enjoy this new life. I enjoy in life without carnality, in life without depravity, in life without defilement, in life without another mind, in life without a stiff neck, a kind of a stubborn a heart. But now I labor, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I represent the Son of God here. I represent Christ here. And what you will do, that is what I will do. I have the mind of Christ. I express the mind of Christ. And I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 6. Romans 
chapter 6, we're reading from verse 6, it says over here, knowing this, knowing this by experience, knowing this as somebody who has visited Calvary, as somebody who has had a new touch of Christ, knowing this experientially, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. The carnal nature is crucified with him. The depraved nature is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. That the body of sin, the root of sin, the nucleus of sin, the entity that generates sin, the very trunk and the root of the tree of sin might be destroyed that henceforth, henceforth we should not serve sin. Henceforth we are not slaves, we are not servants to sin, and sin is not our master anymore. And look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 verse 11. Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. They received the word with all readiness of mind. When our hearts, minds have been transformed and now we have the mind of Christ, as Christ was ready every time to hear the voice and the word of the Father, the mind we have received will make us ready. We're ready every time. We're not afraid. Any correction, let it come. Any cleansing, let it come. Any challenge, let it come. Any new responsibility, let it come. We're not coming to God slowly, measuring our steps, and measuring our receptivity, and measuring, being very careful. I don't know what God will say. I don't know what God will require. So I don't want to rush and, you know, be so excited coming in the presence of God when the mind has been cleansed of the original depraved nature and the mind of Christ has been given to us and he has purified us and purged us and sanctified us we're now ready speak Lord for your sanctified child sanctified servant is hearing I want to learn more I want to receive more when they had the word of God they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to affirm, to confirm, and to be steadfast in the words they have heard, whether those things were so. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 13, it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, not as the word of Paul. That's Paul. He has a strong mind. That's Paul. He has a strong constitution. That's Paul. He has peculiar grace. That's Paul. He has this kind of unworldly attitude. He's out of the world. He's so heavenly minded and he's not thinking of the world. That's, that's Paul. That's the way he will say it. But no, the people whose hearts have been transformed, the people whose hearts have been totally purged and the carnal mind is no more there. When they receive the word of God, they receive the word of God not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That's the kind of heart 
and the kind of mind the Lord wants us to have. And I pray that mind that agrees with the mind of God, that agrees with the heart of God, that agrees with the word of God, will be ours, yours, and mine in Jesus' name. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, reading from verse 35, 1 Samuel chapter 2, reading from verse 35, And I will raise me up a faithful priest, that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. God says the priests, the preachers, the pastors, the ministers, the leaders, and the workers, he will raise up for his kingdom work. They'll be ministers and leaders, pastors and preachers and workers, that will do according to that which is in his heart and in his mind and i will build him a sure house and he shall walk before my anointed forever i pray that will be your experience and my experience in jesus name and with new grace and new strength will go forth with the mind of Christ and declare the totality of the message of Christ, the message of the cross in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 15, reading from verse 5. Romans chapter 15, reading from verse 5. Now, the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like minded one to another according to christ jesus amen verse 6 look at this that ye may with one mind and one mouth that ye all may with one mind and one mouth the leader and the followers the ministers and the members the pastor and the people of god everyone the whole family of god that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your life will glorify God. Your ministry will glorify God. Your activities will glorify God. And with one mind and one mouth, we'll all glorify the Lord together in Jesus' name. Did I hear an amen somewhere there? Yeah. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 2. Philippians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy, that she be like-minded. The same mind, that she be like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. In verse 3, it says, in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Think about your action and think about your deeds, that nothing will be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves respect others honor others appreciate others i thank god for that brother i thank god for that sister i cannot do everything we're all working together even if i give a hundred percent of what i can do if he is not there to give his own part if she is not there to give her own part my hundred percent will not solve the whole problem we esteem each other better than ourselves. And then in verse 4, it says in verse 4, Look not every man 
on his own things, on his own pleasure, on his own convenience, on his own comfort, and on his own pre preference. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In verse 5, this is how that will be possible. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If that were not possible, the commandment would not have come. If, well, I'm a human being, I'm flesh and blood, I'm just a Christian, I'm just a converted, consecrated Christian, and I don't think I can be like Christ and the mind of Christ, I don't think can, I can exhibit that. If that were the case, the apostle will not tell us to do what's impossible. By grace, it is possible. It will be done in Jesus' name. Every time, every moment, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. May the great impartation and may the great oppression of the mind of Christ be in every one of us that everything we do from now on it will be in a christ-like mind in a crucified mind in a consecrated mind and we will do the will of god right from the heart of the mind of christ in jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer and say lord we thank you for your revelation we know it's possible that's why you have revealed yourself Make it uh, your prayer and then say, Lord, do it. The Lord will do it for every one of us in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.